back at the beginning of the semester, we mentioned the fact that motor behavior is subdivided into three uh, areas of, of research, motor development, motor learning, and motor control. So we're just going to take a little dip into some motor learning ideas and principles, and then um, if I get the opportunity to run HP 411 and you'd like to do that for your degree plan, that will be the motor learning information. So we're going to look at what motor learning is all about, what kind of questions the motor learning people ask, and then we'll have a look at how we classify skills because in order to use the motor learning information we have to decide what type of skill it is. Right? And then the idea of motor abilities. Right? So, in motor learning, what is it we're asking about? Right? So, the first idea is what skills people learn. Right? And which ones do are harder to learn, which ones are easier to learn. What is the difference between individuals when we look at that concept? How rapidly they learn. So how quickly can we learn a skill? Right? So that might be important if you are coaching um, in a school or a college scenario where you've got new people coming onto your team but you only get a couple of weeks to work with them before they have to play because of all the rules about how long preseason is allowed to be, right? So maybe if they do something you want to change, how quickly are they able to do that? Is it possible you're going to be able to change something that quick or is that going to be a waste of your training time, right? And then the really key thing, how well do we retain it, right? Because it isn't learned if it's not retained. And if I have to reteach it every time they come out, that's not very helpful, right? So retention of information of skill set is really important, right? How, long, how well do we retain what we've learned over time? So you just want to be a little bit careful with the language here. Skill is the actual task, the actual movement that you're asking them to do. Right? Typically it has a specific goal that we're trying to achieve and we've got to learn it very well if we're going to perform it well. Right? And you could use the term action there. Skilled with the, the, on the end is the quality of the performance. How well are they doing the skill? Right? So you want to make sure that, that you use those words in the right situation. Okay? Alright, so we have two versions of classification systems. The one-dimensional one is very simple. It's been around for a long time. It's the one I learned when I was an undergrad. Um, and it's very useful to um, understand certain characteristics about the skills that you're trying to teach. And so the classification systems just give you a way of identifying skills based upon these characteristics and which skills group together. Because what we find when we look at the motor learning research is that depending on the type of skill, the way I should teach it, or the way I provide practice setups, how often you practice, when you practice, depends upon how you define the skill. Right? 
And when we look at the one-dimensional classifications, as I said, they're very simple. Typically, we've got two main categories at either end of a continuum. And then I'm trying to decide where the skill lies on that continuum. Sorry? I can write it first. Sorry. This is on Blackboard, you can print it out. Unless writing it helps you. Some people writing helps. <laughs> Are you good? We okay? Alright. So we have three of these relatively simple classifications. The first one is the size of the muscles that do most of the work for the skill. And you should recognize when we look at that one a bit more closely, you should recognize the terms that we use there because we've been using them most of the semester. The second is where does the skill start and where does the skill finish? Is it very specific? or is it kind of abstract? And then the third one is what's the environment that the skill takes place in? Right? What are the characteristics of the environment where the skill occurs? So here's our first continuum and we're looking at the muscles that are being used to do the skill. So on one end we have large, on the other end we have small. Technically these are gross motor skills, what we've been working on most of the semester, all right, our fundamental skills, things we're doing with the children on the playground, the kinds of skills that you do in your sport mostly, and on the other end we have fine motor skills, all right, tying up shoelaces, writing, threading a needle, all right, are all fine motor skills. So walking, hopping, jumping then are gross. We have to use big muscles to achieve the goal of the skill. Signing a check. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody in the room have a checkbook up? Oh, good, yay. There's a couple of us that are sticking with that old, old fashioned way. Signing a check, buttoning a shirt, using your keypad, doing your texting. Right? As, a, as a generation, you guys have way advanced fine motor skills compared to my generation because of all the texting and things that you do. The next lot will be even better than you guys are. Right? It's quite scary how quickly you lock and text when I watch you. Generally in class when you're supposed to be watching the Which uh which other fine motor skills <laughs> Yes. Which other uh, fine motor skills do we use yeah. other than like our hands or our toes or like, our mouth or something? Yeah. Um certainly uh soccer players a lot of the um Work that they would do in dribbling would be considered fine. Uh, if you are uh, someone who has had a bad accident and you lose the use of your arms or something, that and you use a, a paintbrush with your mouth, or those would be considered fine motor skills. All right. So you 